The heat is on. The heat is most definitely on in this episode of Revisited, as we're looking back on a quintessential piece of 1980s action slash comedy movie making that helped to launch the career of American footy man Eddie Murphy into the stratosphere. That's right folk, with the much anticipated fourth entry in the series on the horizon, we're taking a retrospective look at the Axel F infused goodness that is Beverly Hills Cop. After you. You guys are so sweet, you know that? Okay, I guess part 4 isn't necessarily much anticipated, but Eddie Murphy has had somewhat of a career resurgence in recent times. But if you had told me 30 years ago that I would be this boring, stay-at-home, you know, house dad, and Bill Cosby would be in jail, <laughs> even I would have took that bet. And apart from a slightly tame and disappointing coming to America, and the relative appeal of you people, he's made a positive return to the spotlight. For now though, sit back, enjoy your prawn salad sandwich, and pop a couple of bananas in a tailpipe, as we look back on the endlessly quotable Eddie Murphy classic, Beverly Hills Cop. Boss, the chief ain't true at all out, you still got a little ass there. Oh, 1984, the golden year that gave us melty face dream bothering psychopaths, time traveling cyborgs, giant sandworms, malevolent, yet hilarious gremlins, plus the start of the global phenomenon that was Ghostbusters, to name but a few. I could go on to list many more big screen classics that are still much loved and rewatched today. However, some restraint is in order, as it also helped us get acquainted with a character and a star on the rise in Eddie Murphy that is not just unforgettable, but iconic in its own right. There was even a time in which Beverly Hills Cop was the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Get the fuck out of here! Somebody else has said it myself! A stat which may surprise some. However, the movie deserves any accolade thrown at it for many reasons. It features many of the classic tropes of the action comedy genre, the fish out of water aspect, the beyond endearing buddy cop trio of Murphy's Axel Foley, alongside the sometimes hapless, well, quite often hapless, Rosewood and Taggart, played by the excellent Judge Reinhold and John Ashton respectively. The plot of the movie sees Murphy's wise-cracking, trigger-mouthed Detroit police officer, who travels to Beverly Hills to investigate the murder of his old friend. Along the way, he encounters a wonderful array of colourful characters. Shh, go ahead, take those bananas. Great set pieces, and violence that set the benchmark for such movies to often imitate long after its release. It was way back in 1977 that the concept for the movie was first developed. The sadly late Don Simpson was a Paramount executive at the time and dreamed up an idea that saw a cop from East LA transfer to Beverly Hills. The movie was originally titled Beverly Drive and screenwriter Danilo Back initially delivered a script that leaned heavily more into action and the project subsequently faltered. However, buoyed by the success of the Adrian Lynn dance drama Flashdance, Simpson saw the opportunity to resurrect his fish out of water cop flick and brought on Daniel Petrie Jr. to rewrite the script. The studio loved the humour that Petrie Jr. had added to the script and the character was also rewritten with the name Axel Ellie rather than Bach's initial moniker for the character, which was Ellie Axel. To be honest, neither of those reverse names scream out tough, wise-cracking, all-action cop. So the name they eventually went with, Axel Foley, is a much better fit for the character. With the film ready to go into production, the studio had to choose just who would fill the shoes of Axel Foley and who would take on directorial duties also. Although you can't imagine anybody but Eddie Murphy playing the role, it's fascinating to look back on who they initially approached for the character. One such name, that would be a ridiculous suggestion nowadays, but albeit a solid choice in the 80s, was Mickey Rourke. His star was on the rise thanks to early roles in movies such as 1981's Body Heat and Rumblefish from 1983. He had great movie star presence, good looks, had a roguish charm that could have added a different, but admittedly intriguing spin on the character. He even signed a holding contract with the studio for $400,000, but after the film's pre-production dragged on longer than expected, he left to take on another project. Another, and arguably an even bigger movie star, was also attached to the project once Rourke had left. The legendary Italian Stalin himself, Sylvester Stallone, who dramatically rewrote the script so that all the humour was gone and it was back to being an all-out action epic. Stallone also rewrote several of the main characters, changing Billy Rosewood to Simmons and killing him off halfway through the narrative 
in one of the action scenes. He also changed the name of the main character to Axel Cabretti, and has since described that his vision for the movie would have looked like the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan on the beaches of Normandy. Believe it or not, the finale was me in a stolen Lamborghini, playing chicken with an oncoming freight train, being driven by the ultra slimy bad guy. That's not a bad concept for an action movie to be fair, but looking back on what the movie eventually became, it's a massive departure from what the studio were looking for. In fact, producer Don Simpson was vocal about not wanting to go ahead with Stallone's script, in which the main character spent too long soaping down his muscles, an image you could most definitely associate with the actor. Also, according to legend, Simpson managed to get Stallone off the project by sending him to Switzerland, and in the meantime, Simpson and fellow producer Jerry Bruckheimer persuaded Eddie Murphy to take the role, and Stallone went on to star in the less than stellar Rhinestone in 1984 instead. Despite Murphy ultimately being offered the role, several other names were attached to the project that are worth mentioning, including Al Pacino, Richard Pryor, James Caan, and Indy himself, Harrison Ford, who also reportedly turned down the role. It's not just the title star who makes the movie so memorable, however, as Murphy is backed up by a tremendous cast consisting of the aforementioned Judge Reinhold and John Ashton as Beverly Hills Cop's Rosewood and Taggart, who proved the perfect straight lace foil to Murphy's snarky foley. We also get Robocop veteran Ronnie Cox as Lieutenant Bobbermill, Lisa Eilbacher as Foley's former acquaintance Jenny Summers, Stephen Burkhoff as slimy bad guy Victor Maitland, plus Better Call Saul legend Jonathan Banks as henchman Zack. Rounding out the main players is the superb Gilbert R. Hall as Foley's take no bullshit superior. You mind telling me where the f you come off going undercover without authorization from me? What the f is this all about? As well as Aliens and more recently Stranger Things star Paul Reiser. I'm trying to tell you. Jeffrey, this is none of your f business. This is not my locker. Plus, the unforgettable Bronson Pinshaw as a scene stealing Serge. Get the f out of here! No, no, I cannot, it's serious! While the process of finding the star for the movie had been something of a chore for the studio, the process of hiring the film's director was somewhat more straightforward. Martin Scorsese was offered the gig, but turned it down as he felt the concept for the movie was too similar to that of 1968's Coogan's Bluff and even body horror maestro David Cronenberg was offered the chance to direct the movie. Ultimately, it was the great Martin Brest who was hired to helm the movie, and, despite his dismissal from War Games in 1983, he delivered exactly what was required for both the film's star and the studio. This is nice. There's a scene towards the beginning of Beverly Hills Cop that helps to establish the key relationship between Axel Foley and his Beverly Hills counterparts that sums up what works so well about the movie. After being arrested for allegedly breaking into Victor Maitland's office, in a scene that ends with one of the funniest lines in the movie, Disturbing the peace, I got thrown out of a window! What's the f***ing charge for getting pushed out of a moving car, huh? Jaywalking? This is bull****! Foley, Rosewood and Taggart meet for the first time and sparks fly, ending with Taggart punching Foley in the gut. It's the perfect setup for the relationship between the characters later in the movie, not just because it establishes just how easily Foley gets under the skin of his usually calm and collected counterparts, but also because Taggart's forced apology shows just how much of a fish out of water Foley really is in Beverly Hills. Look, where I'm from, cops don't file charges against other cops. No, I don't want to do that. After Axel Foley's friend is murdered in cold blood in Detroit, he heads to Beverly Hills to track down the killer. After hearing from his former friend about a security job he had there, courtesy of a mutual acquaintance, Jenny Summers. Mike had also shown Axel some German bearer bonds he had acquired, which ultimately led to his cold-blooded killing outside of Foley's apartment. After Foley reluctantly agrees with Inspector Todd that you'll leave the case alone and get his head wound treated at the hospital, he betrays this trust and goes after some retribution. What follows is not only an iconic, violent, an extremely funny movie, but one that holds up pretty well a few decades later. Yeah, there may not be the flashy quick cuts utilised by many recent action movies, but this works in the film's favour. Each scene is crafted in a measured but very efficient way, with the characters and situations they find themselves in, given room to breathe, and the gags when they arrive come thick and fast with their natural setup. The action is also well handled, especially an opening truck chase with Foley hanging off the back of his speed and juggernaut as it carves its way through the city streets, demolishing cars and almost pedestrians as it goes. Director Bress keeps the action beats coming efficiently, and although the violence is blunt and effective, it serves as the perfect foil to the comedy. Murphy's relationship with Rosewood and Taggart is a touching highlight and there's a nice moment of their two worlds colliding, 
with the Beverly Hills cops being roasted by their colleagues for the banana in the tailpipe incident, just as Murphy had been by his own counterparts for messing up the drugs bust at the start of the movie. The real beating heart of the film then is the key trio of Foley and the initially hapless but ultimately indispensable Rosewood and Taggart. Murphy brings his trademark slick and witty sense of humour to Axel Foley, not giving a flying f about bending the rules or lying about interviewing famous pop stars to get a room in a luxury hotel. However, it's his interactions with the seemingly moronic Rosewood and the stiff as a board target where the movie really shines. Also, we can't write a retrospective review on that movie without mentioning the amazing synth score, Axel F, by Harold Faltermeyer, that pops up in key moments in the film. In fact, the soundtrack for the movie, and Axel F by Faltermeyer in particular, was a major contributing factor to the success of the movie overall. The composer was originally best known for his work on the Top Gun soundtrack, as well as the music and score for the Fletch films, starring Chevy Chase. Axel F proved so popular that it reached number one in several charts around the world and is easily one of the most memorable elements of the movie. The track was originally written solely for a small part of the film, but once Fault and Maya realised the potential for the catchy tune, he persuaded the studio to use it as the main overarching theme throughout the film. Beverly Hills Cop hit theatres on December the 5th, 1984 at 1,532 cinemas in the United States, opening at number one at the box office with a gross of 15 million $214,805 over its first five days of release. The movie stayed at number one for 13 consecutive weeks and eventually tied with the Dustin Hoffman comedy Tootsie for the most weeks at the top spot. It eventually grossed an impressive total of $234,760,478. And, as we touched upon a little earlier in this retrospective, it was the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time until eventually being surpassed by The Matrix Reloaded in 2003. Reviews of the movie were largely positive, and it currently holds an approval rating of 83% from 54 critics on Rotten Tomatoes. The initial response to the movie was also positive, with the New York Times stating that Beverly Hills Cop finds Eddie Murphy doing what he does best, playing the shrewdest, hippest, fastest talking underdog in a rich man's world. Eddie Murphy knows exactly what he's doing, and he wins at every turn. Also full of praise was Time Magazine, who wrote that Eddie Murphy exuded the kind of cheeky, cocky charm that has been missing from the screen since Cagney was a pup, snarling his way out of the ghetto. The role of Axel Foley is arguably what Murphy is most famous for, unless you're under the age of 10 and have a penchant for talking donkeys, that is. You might have seen a house fly, maybe even a super fly, but I bet you ain't never seen a donkey fly. <laughs> as well as an excellent box office and critical praise, the movie also won several awards and was also nominated for Best Original Screenplay at the Academy Awards. As always, let us know your thoughts on Beverly Hills Cop in the comments section. And keep a lookout for more from Axel Foley and friends as we dive into the inevitable sequel in our next episode here on Revisited. The heat is back on in this episode of Revisited as we follow up our last outing with Axel Foley in Beverly Hills Cop with the inevitable sequel. Part 1 proved to be such a mammoth hit that not only helped to send Eddie Murphy's career into the stratosphere, but it guaranteed that Part 2 wouldn't be far away. Goodbye, Mr. James. I guess that's my cue. If you take a look back at the 1980s, there are many franchises that started in the era and still have longevity or an influence in modern Hollywood. However, when you have a movie as popular as Beverly Hills Cop, that doesn't necessarily mean that a sequel will match the quality of the first. And it's been a problem that Hollywood has faced over the years. Just how exactly do you keep your inbuilt audience happy while simultaneously bringing something fresh and new to part two without alienating your audience? The answer is probably in finding a happy medium between familiarity and developing the franchise for newcomers. However, that's easier said than done. That's what I'm afraid of! Obvious examples where the second in the series have matched or perhaps even surpassed the original have to be films such as Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, Aliens, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, Teen Wolf 2. <laughs> okay, that last one may have been a dig at the hopeless hairy follow-up to the fun Michael J. Fox original, but the point is, sequels can be hit or miss. Team Wolf 2 isn't alone in being a howling disaster, as the 80s and other decades onwards 
have delivered some prize turkeys from time to time. Staying Alive, Highlander 2 The Quickening, The Sting 2, Speed 2 Cruise Control, the aforementioned titles are all examples of movies that completely shat on the original. However, what I'm getting at is if done the right way, sequels can be an awesome way to follow up a classic original, or just a shameless cash in. I do believe we have a miss! However, which way did Beverly Hills Cop 2 go? Stay tuned as we tool up Billy Rosewood style here on Revisited. What took you guys so long? <laughs> Looking back on the year in which Beverly Hills Cop 2 arrived, 1987, audiences were spoiled by many classic movies that lit up movie theatres. Just consider the following list, and if only modern day movie making had the same level of originality, we'd all be rushing to our local multiplexes in droves. I'm talking about movies such as Predator, Robocop, Batteries Not Included, The Witches of Eastwick, The Untouchables, Evil Dead 2, Inner Space, Lethal Weapon, Wall Street, The Lost Boys, The Princess Bride, Dirty Dancing, Full Metal Jacket. They were all released in 1987, and that's just several examples. Your move, creep. So by the time Beverly Hills Cop 2 was released in October, audiences had been exposed to a seriously good time at the movies. That's not to say there's a glut of originality in modern filmmaking, far from it. But it would be great to see the studios take a punt on some more original ideas rather than relying on existing franchises or superheroes for audiences to fork out for. After the huge success of the first movie, Paramount Pictures had initially planned on making a TV series based upon the antics of Axel Foley and company. However, leading star Murphy was less than keen on diving headfirst into a TV project, but would be willing to take a punt on a theatrical sequel. Things like this work out. Trust me. Fresh from the massive success of Top Gun in 1986, the late great Northeast England born director Tony Scott was chosen by producers Bruckheimer and Simpson to take Axel Foley back to Beverly Hills. Scott had shown an excellent flair for visual storytelling with the Tom Cruise aerial actioner and his work on The Hunger plus his previous work in television and advertising brought him to the attention of the studio and the production team. With everything in place to commence shooting, production began on the movie on November the 10th 1986 and ultimately wrapped on March the 25th, 1987. Eddie Murphy's salary to reprise his role as Axel Foley was reportedly $8 million, which is quite a chunk of the movie's alleged budget of $27 million. However, what's perhaps not common knowledge to fans of the series is that original director Martin Brest was jettisoned by the producers Bruckheimer and Simpson in favour of Tony Scott. And after the first cut of the movie arrived, it was clear that Scott's not too subtle but effective style was front and centre in terms of action, but it lacked the comedic touch of the first movie. The script shot by Scott didn't have enough gags for the producer's liking, so despite being impressed by the action beats, they ordered rewrites and subsequently reshot several scenes with more humour. Returning for the sequel, naturally, is Eddie Murphy as the wise cracking cop Axel Foley. I'm going so deep, sir, you not even know where I, people are going to try to page me. Excellent. I, no answer, because I'm going to be deep undercover. As well as detectives, Taggart and Rosewood. Again, played by the irrepressible John Ashton and Judge Reinhold. We also get more of Robocop veteran Ronnie Cox, who plays an important part in how the narrative develops. Probably the most notable addition to the cast has to be the Danish Amazonian-esque Bridget Nielsen as Carla Fry, a proper wrongen and a thorn in the side of Foley throughout the movie. German-American actor Jürgen Prochnov joins Nielsen on the side of the bad guys as Maxwell Dent, who may be implicated in the alphabet crimes, a series of mostly high-end store robberies distinguished by monogrammed envelopes with an alphabetical sequence that the assailants leave at the crime scene. A few other familiar faces return for the sequel, with the most notable being Paul Reiser's Detective Friedman, Gilbert Rowland Hill as the awesome Inspector Todd, Where the fuck you been, Foley? Chris Rock as a park and valet, and Playboy legend himself, Hugh Hefner. Hef! Hugh Hefner! Axel Foley! Unfortunately, we don't get to see Bronson Pinchot's surge in the sequel, but such was the character's popularity, he wouldn't stay away from the franchise for long. As well as the key characters and actors who had to return for part two, 
another iconic highlight also makes a return in the sequel, Axel F by Harold Faltermeyer. The synth score that must have helped to sell a billion Yamaha keyboards in the 80s is such a cool piece of music and so very 80s that it's now synonymous with the character and the movies. As well as the main theme, we also get some interesting choices on the soundtrack. The song Hold On by Keta Bill plays during the scene at the Playboy Mansion. While the movie also introduced audiences to George Michael's controversial hit I Want Your Sex. The song reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and was also a hit internationally. However, it did unfortunately win a Razzie for worst song. The Jets hit song Cross My Broken Heart also features on the soundtrack as does the hugely popular Shakedown by Bob Seger. Harold Faltermeyer also provided his song Bad Guys for the movie, and while the soundtrack didn't quite hit the heights in the charts as the first movies did, it still provided a suitably upbeat and memorable addition to the movie. As I'll touch upon a little later in this retrospective, Beverly Hills Cop 2 polarised critics when it was first released. While I found it to be a worthy sequel when I first saw it as an impressionable young lad, I've always been in two minds about it ever since. This is the perfect opportunity then to reappraise the film, and I actually appreciate the movie more now than I think I initially did. Sure, the shift in tone that the late great Tony Scott brought to the franchise is a little jarring at first, and you can see why they shoehorned in some extra gags, but that harder edge works in the movie's favour. Scott had great fun choreographing set pieces, shootouts, dangerous chase scenes, so much so that the polish shine he displayed in previous movies really stands out here. The erotic melodrama of 1983's The Hunger may seem like a world away from Beverly Hills Cop 2, but that visual panache is here, and Scott channels as much of the testosterone fueled mayhem in Top Gun as he can with the action scenes. Also, would anybody have expected Uber producers Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer to not bring anything other than just a facsimile of the first movie? But with more bang for your buck in the sequel? Set three years after the events in Beverly Hills Cop, the sequel sees Eddie Murphy's streetwise detective Axel Foley return to the city after an assassination attempt on his friend Captain Andrew Bogomil, played of course by Robocop legend Ronnie Cox. The action is set against the backdrop of an endless string of violent smash and grab robberies, known as we mentioned earlier as the Alphabet Crimes. Detectives Rosewood and Taggart are struggling to solve the case. Their pursuit leads them and Murphy's Axel Foley into another life or death mission. The concept is pretty sound and the inclusion of Nielsen is a great move. The Danish Amazonian had just come off a trio of roles that saw her star on the rise. The fun but flawed Red Sonja in 1985 and a double bill with Sly Stallone in Rocky IV, also from 1985. Plus action crime thriller Cobra from 1986. Nielsen was married to Sylvester Stallone at the time, and there's a few scenes poking fun at his movies throughout the film, suggesting some tension behind the scenes. Much like in the first movie, the best parts of the sequel, and arguably the funniest, are the scenes in which Murphy plays off against Reinhold and Ashton's Rosewood and Taggart. Their chemistry is great, and they provide some more iconic and memorable sequences to expand upon what we got in the original. Also, while Bridget Nielsen and Jürgen Prochnov make great villains, their evil scheme involving a multi-million heist seems to be slightly convoluted and more elaborate than it needs to be. Overall, however, the movie is a worthy sequel to an admittedly stronger part one. It may not have the natural charm and humour that the original seemed to provide effortlessly, but its action and terrific chemistry with the main leads makes this a must-watch, ideally as a double bill with part one. I'm just doing this for my kids. Just the same way Booty got killed. Beverly Hills Cop 2 was one of the most anticipated movies of 1987, and while it didn't make quite as much as Beverly Hills Cop, it was still a box office hit upon release. The film debuted at number one at the US box office and recouped $33 million over its opening weekend, making it the highest weekend opening for not just the year, but of all time at the time. It ultimately grossed almost $154 million in the US and Canada and was the third biggest hit that year, domestically, coming in behind the bunny boiling fatal attraction and hit comedy, Three Men and a Baby. Its final gross worldwide was $276 million, making it the second highest grossing film of the year. Again, being beaten by Glenn Close's fluffy bunny hating thriller, Fatal Attraction. Critically, the movie was met with a predictably mixed reception. On Rotten Tomatoes, 
The film has a 46% rotten rating based on 39 reviews, while the site's critical consensus reads, Eddie Murphy remains appealing as the wisecrack and Axel Foley, but Beverly Hills Cop 2 doesn't take him or the viewer anywhere new enough to justify a sequel. The Washington Post were very positive in their appraisal of the movie, calling it a sequel that's as good as the original, if not better. Roger Ebert did not like the movie one little bit, awarding it one star out of four and stating, What is comedy? That's a pretty basic question, I know, but Beverly Hills Cop 2 never thought to ask it. Megastar Eddie Murphy probably sums up the movie's reception better than anybody with an honest assessment, saying that Beverly Hills Cop 2 was probably the most successful mediocre picture in history. It made $250 million worldwide and it was a half assed movie. Cop 2 was basically a rehash of Cop 1, but it wasn't as spontaneous and funny as the original. As always, let us know your thoughts on Beverly Hills Cop 2 in the comments section and keep a further look out for more from Axel Foley and friends as we tentatively dive into the much maligned part 3. Was it really the worst entry in the franchise or did Murphy and Co manage to at least bring some humour and raucous action to the threequel? Serge is back so it can't be all bad, right? I don't believe this act well! Plus the post is pretty cool, it's got a roller coaster on it and everything. Stay tuned to find out movie fans and we'll see you next time. The Heat is back on for a third time in this episode of Revisited, but after huge success with the first two instalments, hey! can lightning strike a third time in the massively popular Beverly Hills Cop series? Of course it can. I mean, the formula's there, the main star of the franchise is back, and the poster has a kick-ass roller coaster on it, which is pretty edgy if you're a ten-year-old. <laughs> So, naturally, nothing could go wrong. Well, look, the franchise has legs, with part 4 in post-production at the time of writing this episode, and Netflix looking at a summer release for the movie. Watch your ass out there, okay? I'm gonna be fine. They love me in Beverly Hills. It's a popular modern trend in Tinseltown, where legacy characters, or franchises, are being resurrected for final outings or a continuation of the mythology to keep modern audiences interested in a known and historically lucrative IP. Indy may have not been able to draw a crowd like he used to, despite the, hopefully, final movie in Harrison Ford's role as the adventurer being a fun, batshit crazy, but often dull entry in the series. However, other fan favourites such as Ghostbusters live on, with the well-received and commercially successful Ghostbusters Afterlife in 2021, being followed up by the cool-looking, no pun intended, Frozen Empire, that's set to hit cinemas at the end of March. Yeah. The point is, if done well, legacy characters and movie franchises can be fun to revisit on the big or small screens. However, if Universal ever dares to reboot, reimagine, or tinker with the Back to the Future series in case something potentially offensive happens in one of them, I'll be livid. But, not surprised, three calls can be somewhat hit and miss, with some movies looking to make a quick buck by rolling out the cast for a cash grab at the expense of a solid movie. Which way did Beverly Hills Cop 3 ultimately go? Well, strap yourselves into the spider ride as we find out here on Revisited. Thanks for the show. So unnecessary. When Beverly Hills Cop 3 hit cinemas in May 1994, Eddie Murphy wasn't necessarily on a hot streak of success at the box office. Harlem Nights in 1989 divided critics and audiences, to say the least. I gotta go to the bathroom. While sequel Another 48 Hours from the following year couldn't match the wit or charm of the first movie. Boomerang in 1992 was fun, but by then Murphy's somewhat smug on-screen characters were maybe starting to grate on audiences. At least, the box office receipts from the time would suggest so. When approached about starring in a threequel to one of his most successful movies, he may have ultimately seen some kind of redemption in the form of Axel Foley, a way to win audiences back. After all, both Beverly Hills Cops 1 and 2 
are riotously entertaining in their own right. We all love a fish out of water story and Murphy's arrogant, witty and charming central character is a blast to have seen at the time and also to revisit years later. So surely with a decent director on board, check, Murphy's return, double check, plus fan favourites back and a cool story, triple ch- Actually, I'm not sure I can confirm that one. Anyway, most of the ingredients were there for a rollick and roller coaster, pun intended, for part three. When asked in 1989 about whether he would star in a third instalment, Murphy poured scorn on whether or not his return as 40 would be some kind of redemptive triumph, saying, there's no reason to do it. I don't need the money and it's not gonna break any new ground. How often can you have Axel Foley talk fast and get into a place he doesn't belong? But these motherfuckers are developing scripts for it. They're in pre-production. The only reason to do a COP3 is to beat the bank. And Paramount ain't gonna write me no check as big as I want to do something like that. In fact, if I do a COP3, you can safely say, oh, he must have got a lot of money. Okay, I guess he wasn't that keen then but I'm sure the reported $15 million salary that Murphy was offered did indeed beat the bank. <coughs> Despite Murphy having reservations about kicking some ass and wisecracking his way to that reported $15 million paycheck, the production did have its director in place. And he was, on paper at least, a solid choice, John Landis. Best known for hairy werewolf makeovers, Landis had already directed Murphy in 1993's Trading Places and 1988's Coming to America. Yes! Yes! But up until Beverly Hills Cop 3, he had mainly teamed up with Michael Jackson again for some nifty music videos. Also, as we'll delve into a little later in this video, the relationship between Landis and Murphy wasn't too healthy. So with the man in the director's chair chosen and the main star eventually on board, the production could go ahead but a multitude of script revisions and the availability of key actors had to be ironed out. Hey, Taggart, where is he? I'd love to say hello to him. Man, you'll have to fly to Phoenix. Taggart's retired. Spends his days lost in the woods looking for his golf balls. Early script drafts would see Foley, Taggart and Rosewood travel to the good old UK to rescue Captain Bogomil, who had been kidnapped and held hostage by terrorists during an international police convention. I guess this is a little too close to the plot of the second movie, which saw Bogomil gunned down by the Amazonian Bridget Nielsen. Plus, the pre-production stage slowed down to such a degree that both John Ashton and Ronnie Cox had to drop out due to filming obligations elsewhere. Intriguingly, however, in an interview from 2012, Ronnie Cox revealed another possible reason, saying, They wanted me to be in Beverly Hills Cop 3, but I read the script. It wasn't looking good for the threequel, even at that early stage. Fortunately for all involved, Judge Reinhold was back as gun-loving detective Billy Rosewood, plus another franchise favourite in the late great Gilbert R. Hill as the tough-talking Inspector Todd. However, that's just about as notable as the cast gets, unless you count an appearance by John Travolta's older brother Joey. What the world. Thankfully, the art world's best espresso maker Serge is back, but could he save the threequel from falling into the trend of part threes often being, well, terrible? No way. I don't believe this arc well! During the time that Beverly Hills Cop 2 was released, it was pretty much guaranteed that a new Eddie Murphy movie would equate to box office gold. Such was his own golden touch when it came to picking a good project. I, 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 I want the knife. Which brings us nicely to what is, arguably, a serious misfire for all involved. It was considered a surprise that Murphy had agreed to fill the wisecracking shoes of Foley again, and even more surprising that he would do so under the direction of John Landis. During a press conference in New York to promote Coming to America, Murphy was asked if he would ever consider working with Landis again, to which he replied, Vic Morrow has a better chance of working with Landis than I do. This somewhat tasteless comment refers to a horrific accident during the shooting of the segment Landis was directing for the Twilight Zone movie, in which Morrow and two young child actors died. Landis was eventually acquitted of involuntary manslaughter, but this just shows how fractious their relationship really was. This may also explain why the threequel is a largely soulless, expensive, sporadically entertaining mess that tarnished the name of what was once a hugely enjoyable franchise. The plot sees Foley investigating a car theft ring, 
but he comes face to face with the men who kill his boss, Inspector Todd, during a raid on a chop shop. No! This leads him to pursue the killers to a theme park, where they're running a counterfeit money ring, and we subsequently get treated to some fairly well staged but lifeless set pieces. The plot also takes a detour to Beverly Hills, naturally, so that Judge Reinhold's Billy Rosewood can tag along. But even the gun-toting detective can't save the movie from threequel obscurity. Unfortunately then, cheap gimmicks replace any real characterization, and what could have been a rollicking die-hard in Wonderworld turns into a lazy, uninspired attempt to round out the franchise. Murphy shoots a whole load of bad guys, which is appreciated. He also swears more than Joe Pesci in Casino. Drop that fucking gun! Well, almost. And even dresses up as an elephant at one point, shoving a poor kid into a fountain and calling him a... Oh, you little motherfucker, I'll kick your ass. You see, Murphy hadn't gone soft. No, far from it. We're supposed to buy into the idea that the movie is the genuine article, a worthy part three. But unfortunately, it's simply awful. He was firing a weapon in the park. My God, there are hundreds of small, innocent children around. You know they don't give out Oscars in prison, right? Beverly Hills Cop 3 was released on May the 25th, 1994, and grossed $42.6 million in the US, and $76.5 million at the foreign box office, for a worldwide total of $119.2 million. It opened alongside the equally irritating The Flintstones, which opened at number one at the box office, with Beverly Hills Cop 3 languishing in third behind Mel Gibson's Maverick. The film received negative reviews from critics and was considered by them, and Murphy himself, as the weakest film in the trilogy, but also admitting in an interview from 1994 that the movie is different from the trilogy's first instalment because Axel is more mature and no longer the wise-cracking rookie cop. Landis, on the other hand, was more candid about his experience on this movie, saying that Cop 3 was a very strange experience. The script wasn't any good, but I figured, so what? I'll make it funny with Eddie. But then I discovered on the first day when I started giving Eddie some shtick, he said, you know, John, Axel Foley's an adult now. He's not a wise ass anymore. The movie also has a very low approval rating of 11% based upon 56 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, if the stats from that website mean anything to you. As always though, let us know your thoughts on Beverly Hills Cop 3 in the comments. And don't despair because, as I'm sure you're all aware, Murphy is back to redeem the franchise, hopefully, with the upcoming Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. Due to be released by Netflix this summer, the main cast are all back so can the movie successfully put the mess of part three firmly in the past and provide the perfect goodbye for such an iconic character? Thanks for watching, and we'll see you awesome folk next time here on Revisited.